can use ranges. Obviously, you know, if you got no points lost, that would be like an A plus. If you had like eight points lost, that would be an A minus. And then close to those values uh, would also be the same grades in, in the middle of the A. Same thing as you go down uh, to these other, go down to the other brackets as well. Um, I want to make a, so it's important to note here. This is not this is an approximate curve. Uh, which side? So say you had like an eight or you had a nine. Which side of that boundary you're on has absolutely like almost zero impact on what your final grade in the class would be. Okay. So this is the eventual curve in the course is going to be calculated using the total number of points that people have accumulated um, through you know the exams and the problem sets and a little bit of participation as well. Uh, and then that's going to be curved. So it's not like if you got an eight, there's there's no entry in our spreadsheet where you are recorded as having an A minus. Whereas if you got a nine, you're recorded as having a B plus. This is only for sort of you know guidance of how you should be thinking in terms of your performance on the exam. Obviously, not curved. If you're just doing ninety percent, then the point loss would, would uh, end at like four point five or so, four point five for uh, N A minus because that would be like nine percent. Um, if you uh, certainly if you got Low. If you lost more than three points, uh, you should probably come talk to me. Uh, and probably during like the 22 to 30 range, uh, you should probably come and talk to me. Uh, the other thing to note is that uh, you know, so there were two versions, and I did go and look at um, how the so the versions were basically like randomly distributed. It'd be very surprising if there was any sort of systematic component in terms of who got version A versus version B. And uh, I did compare the performance on the two versions because the the questions for the answers for them diverged more than I had intended because of the typo on the exam. Uh, and so I was a little bit concerned that maybe people with version B would end up doing better or worse on average than people with version A. Uh, that definitely was not the case. So there was um, there was no statistically significant difference in performance across the two versions. Uh, I think the version A maybe did, or version B maybe empirically did like two points better on average, but it's basically, I, I went and looked at the actual distribution of scores, and the only the only difference was driven by people at the sort of extreme tail, so people in the like uh, range where they're missing 26, 27, uh, 30 points or something like that. Um, so if you're in that range, uh, you know, which version you got is probably not the, the primary issue that uh, we should be concerned about with the class. So uh, the, the bottom line is uh, there, there doesn't seem to have been any uh, impact on, on scores of which version you got. So we won't do a separate curve for each of the two versions. Um, that's about it. Oh, I guess the other thing is that, so in terms of if you have questions about the grading, so uh, Megan, who's our reader, Graded, let's see, uh, problems. So two would be like three A and four. So that's five total parts or subparts, because there's three parts to uh, problem four. And then uh, I graded the other one, so that would be one, and then three B through three D. Uh, so you'll have to ask, like, there's no point in really asking me about once you graded or vice versa, because uh, the most important thing from our perspective for grading is that there's a consistent standard applied across all of the, you know, all, all of you guys. Uh, and so whatever standard Megan is applying, she should continue to apply to everybody, and whatever standard I'm applying, I'll continue to apply to everybody. Uh, so depending on, you know, which problems you have questions about, you should either email her or combine my office hours. Uh, we also, um, you know, so if we're going to look at the, the problem, we do have, we uh, reserve the right to do a regrade of the entire exam, or at least all the, the problems that we were uh, involved in. So, you know, there is, you should, you should be pretty confident that you really think that, you know, there was a mistake with the grading, uh, because it's possible that when we regrade it, we might decide that we, in fact, hadn't taken off enough points rather than taking off uh, too many points or something like that. Okay. Um, so I think that's it in terms of uh, the midterms. The scores are also on uh, B courses. So if you want to, I'm like 99.5% confident that everything for the midterms is recorded correctly because uh, I did do a double entry. Uh, but it, you know, you can never be too safe if you want to check and make sure that the scores that we've actually recorded correspond to what you have on your exam. That's not a bad idea. Uh, the other the other thing is um, in terms of grades, like I also uh, put the problem set grades for the first three uh, problem sets to B courses. Those ones I would recommend checking because I personally encountered one uh, instance where the, the score on the problem set did not correspond to the score that had been recorded. Uh, so you definitely should double check and make sure that there wasn't a mistake that was made there. Okay, so uh, the, the topic that I want to cover for the next couple of days is going to be about um, essentially uh, thinking about sort of another determinant of, uh, of health. So in this case, uh, it's going to be talking about like uh, fast food and what the potential impacts on, uh, on health are uh, from that. So this is kind of like, uh, I mean, I don't know, I think it's sort of in between thinking about like environmental determinants of health and thinking about uh, like uh, the actual healthcare system. You know, this is something that is kind of a public health issue. Uh, it's, I wouldn't really say it's like a case of externalities. Um, I mean, you could say that people, since people have health insurance, then if they do things that are bad for their own health, they generate an external cost because that cost is going to be covered by taxpayers uh, when they, or, or uh, well, either taxpayers or um, you know, other people who are in their health plan, basically. Um, when they go and use medical services, uh, but you know that's basically true of anything you can do that might potentially impact your health. Um, and this is more just thinking about sort of uh, um, like sort of public policies that might have an impact on population health. Uh, so the so the focus here is going to be on uh, sort of a couple of sets of policies. So the first study that we're going to look at, which is a study that I did with a uh, former classmate of mine in grad school, who's now at Northwestern, is just looking at the actual effect of availability of fast food on uh, health. And then the second study that we'll talk about is looking at sort of a specific set of policies, uh, which are look, which are uh, designed about or designed around sort of increasing the uh, amount of information that's available to consumers. So it's these like uh, calorie labeling or menu labeling laws that have started to be passed in I think, a bunch of larger cities, and looking at whether or not those induce consumers to potentially make healthier choices when they're at a fast food restaurant, or really any restaurant that is covered by the laws. Um, okay, so uh, the, the sort of outcome that we're interested in here is obesity, uh, and the reason is that it's becoming um, sort of one of the top two public health threats uh, in developed countries, particularly in the United States. Uh, and it's something that clearly so, you know, clearly is an upward trend in obesity, but the underlying causes that uh, that are causing that trend are uh, are not really uh, understood except at sort of the most basic level. So we know that there has to be some combination of increased caloric intake and or decreased activity levels. You know, that's how people gain weight. Uh, so one or both of those things has to be operating at some level, uh, but that's not really you know sort of that's like sort of a very basic like biological description of the problem, but it doesn't really give us any insight into what's changed in the economy or public policies or basically how people live uh, that's potentially driving those factors. Uh, so in terms of the actual uh, increase in obesity rates have roughly doubled since 1980, uh, and it's considered to be the second leading cause of preventable death uh, after uh, smoking, of course. So 
it's a, you know, a serious problem, but you know, we don't really uh, know what the uh, origins of this uh, epidemic are. Another way of stating it is uh, we don't really know sort of what the inputs are at a sort of economy-wide or society-wide level that determine the prevalence of obesity. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of uh, potential explanations that have been thrown out, and the one that we're interested in, in trying to study in this particular uh, paper was whether or not increased consumption of fast food uh, is, or of restaurant food in general, uh, is potentially to, uh, to blame here. So fast food is, in fact, you know, associated with increased caloric intake. Uh, that shouldn't come as a big surprise to anybody. Uh, and it's also the case that portion sizes have grown. So there's a sort of influential paper, I think, in the, the um, uh, public health literature where these authors went back and documented like the size of the portions that McDonald's uh, has served over time since it's one of the older uh, fast food chains, and so they can actually go back to like the 1950s and 1960s and see like how large the hamburgers and how large the French fries were when McDonald's was serving them back then. Uh, and as you, I don't know, might not be surprised to learn, uh, they've grown uh, substantially. So you know, even sort of thinking about like ordering a hamburger at McDonald's or ordering order French fries at McDonald's uh, today, uh, you know, many decades later, you're potentially getting maybe like twice as many calories uh, because the, the portion size has grown so substantially. Um, so that sort of seems like okay, you know, people are eating more when they go to fast food restaurants, then uh, you can certainly think that that's going to be a contributor to obesity. But the problem is you kind of don't really know how much is on the supply side and how much is on the demand side, right? So if it's the case, so the, the story in which fast food is kind of the culprit is one in which McDonald's has been increasing the, the size of its portions, uh, not because they're necessarily like, you know, I don't think they're sitting in some boardroom trying to like scheme up ways to, uh, to uh, make the population fat, like um, Dr. Evil in, uh, in one of the Austin Power movies. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, I think that um, uh, potentially you could think about sort of competitive pressures that might cause them to continually upsize their offerings and or sort of advances in what's called technology that allow them to serve like more food at a, at a cheaper price. So there's sort of these supply side pressures that are causing McDonald's to increase its portion sizes and then consumers don't necessarily have enough control to like not eat the full hamburger or whatever, even if they sort of didn't necessarily want to eat the whole thing. Uh, you know, that would be a story in which uh, like the fast food industry itself was a primary contributor to obesity. Um, but the other, the flip side would sort of be like a demand side story where for whatever reason people are just sort of increasing their caloric intake, maybe because they're richer or uh, maybe because who knows, you know, they could have like more stressful lifestyles that just make them like overeat or something like that, whatever you can come up with a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, and if that's true, then McDonald's sort of just giving consumers what they want. Uh, and if they didn't, if McDonald's didn't give it to them, then somebody else potentially would. Um, so, you know, I think that I think that, that the, the fact that portion sizes have grown substantially is interesting, but it doesn't necessarily tell us sort of which way the causality runs between uh, between like fast food availability and uh, obesity. There are also some studies that uh, basically looked at the relationship between body mass index and uh, restaurants per capita. So they were using like state level data on the number of restaurants that were in the state and uh, BMI, which is basically your um, weight divided by your height squared. So it's supposed to be a measure of obesity. It's not so that people will like often complain about BMI as a measure because so sort of in the if you think of it like at an individual level, like if you measure the BMI of everybody in I don't know the classroom or uh, I mean, we're not we're, we're kind of like a pretty homogeneous group in here. Uh, but if we grab some people from like a football team or put them here or something like that, uh, those are people who basically have high BMIs because they have like relatively high amount of muscle mass, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily think of, think of them as being uh, as being you know, obese. Uh, I think like Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, has a high BMI. So it's not like the greatest measure of obesity because there are ways that you can be heavy that don't really involve being fat. Uh, but that being said, you know, when you plot like the time series of like average BMI, uh, for the entire U.S. population, or just say for like you know, middle-aged males and middle-aged females. Uh, so over the years, you can see it's clearly trending upwards, uh, and it's definitely not the case that you know. So this is like whatever 2015. And this is like 1950. It's definitely not the case that the underlying cause of this trend is that everybody in 2015 is like super buff because they're always hitting the gym, and everybody in 1950 was um, you know, not really fat but also didn't have any muscle mass or something like that. So I think sort of at the aggregate level, uh, the trends of BMI are, are pretty hard to sort of deny in terms of um, being representative of the, uh, the increase of obesity. So so these papers did find a, a um, positive relationship between uh, restaurants per capita and BMI, uh, but the problem is that a lot of that relationship is actually just identified off of these time trends that I mentioned. So they have like data that, that goes across states. Uh, but also covers like 15 or 20 years. Uh, and we know that BMI is trending upwards over time. It also turns out that the number of restaurants per capita is trending upwards over time. You know, I think it's probably just a reflection of uh, society getting richer and so people can afford to eat out more often. Uh, and so you do find a positive relationship between these two variables, but it's just because they're both trending upwards over time. There's a lot of things that basically if you were to regress one time series on the other, you would find uh, a significant relationship, which clearly has no causal interpretation. Um, so, uh, so I think that, you know, I think that sort of the evidence there is, is certainly a useful fact to know, but it, again, is not very useful for trying to think about uh, establishing causality between like restaurant density and uh, obesity. So despite this fact, uh, at least certainly when we started the paper, I think a lot of policymakers were sort of considering regulations, uh, and to some degree still are, that, that target restaurants in the, the fight against obesity. So the thing that's most common and you know, that we have seen uh, being rolled out over the last few years, and I think probably will continue to spread, are these nutritional information requirements. So these are requirements where you have to like post the number of calories and the amount of fat per item uh, on your menu or on any advertising. Uh, usually they only apply to restaurants that have a certain number of um, like establishments, a certain number of stores. So of course, you know, all the fast food chains, but even sort of maybe smaller chains, as long as they have they need sort of that minimum threshold, uh, they'll be covered by these uh, by these requirements. And so far, they've mainly been at the city level. So like New York City was the most prominent one to roll them out, and that's one that we'll look at uh, in the, the second paper that I mentioned. Uh, there's also advertising bans, not so much in uh, the U.S. but in Europe. They have sort of like advertising bans where uh, companies like McDonald's can't necessarily run advertisements that would be on like networks or, or, or um, places where it would clearly be targeted to uh, children. Uh, you see it with zoning regulations where uh, basically, you know, cities will uh, not allow fast food restaurants to open up. So often that's not really because of... Um, that's not like because of health reasons. So if you go to Orinda, for example, just over the hills, you know, they don't have any fast food restaurants. I don't think they would say that uh, they have a nation sense it, but I don't think they would say that um, they're doing that uh, to protect population health. Although maybe they would make that claim. I think it's more about like they're kind of doing it because they don't think they would help the property values in the downtown business district. Uh, that being said, there was I know there was a case in um, in Los Angeles. I don't know if it was Los Angeles itself or one of the other uh, incorporated areas in the city, but basically it was like a poor neighborhood where they already had a lot of fast food restaurants and they sort of passed a moratorium on opening fast food restaurants for a certain number of years, uh, and they did like motivate that in terms of like trying to uh, improve population health in that area. Uh, there have been proposals for fast food taxes. None of them have been really successful. There's one in Detroit that like kind of came close to passing, but you know I think the city had other problems. Um, my favorite was a ban. And there was a proposed ban I think it was in Alabama
experiment in this case, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but certainly, you know, people select whether or not, they self-select into whether or not they want to eat at, uh, at, say, McDonald's, just to use them as like the sort of poster, uh, poster child for, for fast food. And you would certainly think that people who have what we'll call higher caloric demand, but basically what the nutritionists would call like, you know, unhealthy eating habits, uh, are going to be the people who disproportionately choose to eat at McDonald's. So, um, so we don't know essentially sort of like what they would have done had they not eaten at McDonald's. And also, if you think about it, you know, even if the restaurants do deliver more calories in a given meal, uh, it's possible that people will at least partially offset those calories by eating less throughout the, uh, the rest of the day. So if they're like sort of fully rational in terms of how economists think about people, which isn't always realistic, then they would actually anticipate that they're going to have a big meal and potentially eat less earlier in the day. Um, but certainly, you know, if they have a big lunch, uh, then they'll probably at least on the margin eat somewhat less for dinner just because they'll be full. So, so just because you sort of observe people eating large portions at fast food restaurants doesn't necessarily mean that those are that, like you know, the existence, the presence of a fast food restaurant is like a key contributor to obesity. Um, so really, the question that we'd like to know uh, are the answers to are sort of what is the you know, what are the counterfactuals? Would the consumer have or the customer have eaten less if they eaten at home rather than eating at the restaurant? Uh, and so, in order to to get a handle on uh, answering this question, basically what we need is some sort of variation in restaurant prices that's uncorrelated with demand. So you can think of, I mean, so we're going to talk about basically restaurant availability. So this is like whether or not there's a restaurant close to you. Uh, but as economists, we kind of think of that just being folded into like the uh, net price of the restaurant, right? So the, the, the price of going to a restaurant consists of both the actual menu price, like the cost that you pay when you go there, and then also sort of the time cost or the convenience of getting there. Uh, so even if McDonald's is really cheap, if you had to drive like 20 miles to go to McDonald's, you probably would not choose to do that. Particularly if like the motivation for going there is that it's fast anyway. You know, it's going to take you an hour round trip or something uh, to, to get there and get back. Uh, you're not going to save any time. So what we did in the study is uh, we used interstate highways in rural areas uh, as essentially a shock or source of variation uh, in restaurant supply that hopefully should be uncorrelated with local demand. Um, so you can uh, you, know, you can sort of think of it maybe as being a little bit like uh, the the Korean Walker paper where they had those like you know, Easy Pass uh, going on as a source of uh, variation in, in pollution. Uh, uh, to be clear, ours was before theirs, but um, the the. Uh, the, the idea is essentially that if you think about uh, what uh, is or like why the restaurants are going to locate near interstate highways, um, you know the, the reason is not be because they're uh, trying to serve the local customers there. They're not, they're not trying to serve like the people who happen to live near these interstate highways in rural areas, but rather they're trying to uh, to, to serve uh, you know the travelers who are on the highways uh, and want to just pull off the road. So so the extreme example of this, which I don't think really appears in our data, but if you go to like um, so they know like if you go on the East Coast and you're driving on like uh, Interstate 95, which technically runs all the way up from like I think Florida to Maine or something like that, but um, what you'll find in, in many locations are these like travel plazas where essentially uh, you know you can pull off and there's like a gas station or multiple gas stations and some fast food restaurants and stuff. Uh, and so those are literally there just to serve the people who are driving on Interstate 95. Uh, you know I don't think. There's no like, I don't think there's any local access for people. You can always, of course, get onto the highway, which is often a tollway, and go to that place if you wanted to go to a fast food restaurant. But I'm guessing that very few people do that, especially if you end up having to, to drive on the tollway. Um, so that's kind of the extreme example where uh, you have fast food restaurants that are clearly there just to serve the travelers. Uh, we're not going to use that. Again, it wouldn't actually be very useful for us because we wanna, what we want to think about is the possibility that local people would be going to these restaurants. Um, uh, but you can sort of think of it as you know, cases where uh, there are these sort of large clusters of fast food restaurants to serve the travelers. And then, kind of unintended side effect of that is that local people will also have access to fast food that they might not have otherwise had. So what we're going to do is essentially compare two groups of towns. Uh, those that are like literally right on the highway, so zero to five miles from the highway, are going to have good access to fast food, and those that are somewhat further uh, are going to have somewhat poor access to so um, we kind of drew these, these boundaries at 0 to 5 versus 5 to 10 miles, uh, although we sort of experimented with other choices. So if you wanted to kind of widen it out, you could go think about like going 0 to 10 versus 10 to 20. The point is that whenever, however you draw them, you know, that inner ring, the inner uh, uh, boundary uh, around the highway is going to have better access to fast food than the people who live somewhat further out. So the idea is that the, you know, the two groups of towns should display differentials in restaurant access that hopefully will be uncorrelated with local demand for restaurants or with general health practices or other things that might determine the obesity levels of those restaurants or those towns are. Um, so just to give you a sense of like what this actually looks like in, pra in practice, uh, what we had, so what we had are basically data on restaurants at the zip code level and then also data on um, body mass index at the zip code level. So there's like a pretty large telephone survey that the CDC administers every single year where they call up several hundred thousand people uh, and ask them, so it's called the, the BARFIS, is what we like to call it, I think is what the public health people call it, um, which is like behavioral factor, sort of behavioral risk factor surveillance system. And they ask a whole bunch of questions, but sort of, uh, the questions that were interest, of interest to us, they ask you what your height is and what your weight is, uh, and so we can calculate BMI. Um, even at several hundred thousand people, like that is a sampling rate that's maybe about one in a thousand, which would not be ideal from our perspective. So what we're going to do, we know, like the CDC is calling these people, or the state health is calling these people, or the contractor is, and we know exactly uh, or approximately where they live, like basically within a, a zip code. Uh, and so if we get enough people in that zip code, then we can figure out what the average obesity level is in that zip code. The problem is that uh, we're, so we're going to stack multiple years of data, um, but even at a sampling, even if we're calling several hundred thousand people per year, that's only giving you like one in a thousand people. So if the zip code has you know, say a thousand people in it, you would only get maybe like ten people sampled out of um, uh, you know over ten years, uh, which isn't still isn't that great. Um, we're going to use lots of zip codes, so there's, you know, the law of large numbers, numbers will start working in our favor after a while. Uh, the, the thing that worked out well for us is that it turns out that this is kind of like, it's administered or like overseen by CDC, but it's actually uh, sort of handled directly by the state health departments. And they're interested in creating statistics uh, at the state level as well. So they end up uh, dramatically oversampling the smaller states. So like California uh, will have more people in this survey than, um, say, like South Dakota, uh, but not that many more. Like we might have like twice as many people as South Dakota in the survey, even though our population is, you know, whatever, like 30 or 50 times larger or something like that. So the sampling rates of the smaller rural states, which is where we wanted to look anyway, given that we were looking at like you know, towns that were near uh, interstate highways and rural areas, uh, turned out to be much higher. So that worked out well for us. So, Oh, so just to, to clarify, so in this uh, in this map, what you're seeing are the interstate highways um, in some states, like I don't know Kansas, maybe, and Iowa, and um, some other Midwestern states. And what you, so what we have here are these like blue triangles versus the the red dots. And so the red dots are the towns that are like zero to five miles from the highway, so they're the ones that, that lie almost directly on the highway. And then the blue triangles are the ones that lie some 